Uh, testing, can you all hear? Good. <laughs> okay, Betty. <laughs> just, yeah, just yell out. We're, we're pretty informal here. Well, welcome back, students of catechism. Um, we will be meeting every, well, you know, there might be some exceptions, but our regular scheduled meeting is every the first Monday, pardon me, the first Tuesday and the third Tuesday of the month. Uh, we may, t some things may come up and I may have to alter that a bit, but it will be in the bulletin, so check the bulletin and find out for sure, you know, in my column I always put at the very bottom, you know, things that are going on in the parish, and, and so I usually put the catechism class in there. For those of you who are viewing at home, <laughs> Our, our TV audience. Uh, there's a phone number to call if you have a question. Uh, Mr. Krause will relay your question to me and we'll answer it uh, as best we can. And uh, anybody else who's here in church, if you have a question and I say something outrageous that you uh, need to respond to, just raise your lunch hook, as one of my old seminary professors used to say, and I'll call on you and I'll do the best to ignore you. The, uh, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Well, you know, we, this is all sequential. Uh, we've been at this six years now, believe it or not. I, I, some of you have been here for all six years. I know. So you're the ones who are fully enlightened. And uh, we've actually made it, to, in my book, to page 224, to paragraph number 852. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come and be with us. Enlighten our minds with heavenly wisdom. Flame our hearts with the fire of divine love. That everything that you teach us today may enlighten our minds, making us wise, and inflame our hearts, making us holy, filled with charity, loving you and loving what you teach us. And that from this knowledge and from this love, we may have a more faithful service of you every day. These things we ask in Jesus' name, our Lord, forever and ever. Amen. St. Angela Marisi, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. She founded the Catholic school system, you know. Okay. Uh, again, we're talking in this section about the four marks of the church. They're the ones that we say every Sunday in the Creed, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. That's how you know what the true church is. Uh, there's many pretenders to be the true church. The one that is the true church is unified because we know just instinctively that where you find unity, you find the Holy Spirit. Where you find the Holy Spirit, you find unity. When you find people who just can't get along for whatever reason, uh, you know that the, the diabolical element is there. The devil rejoices in chaos. The devil rejoices in mayhem. The devil basically spends his time trying to split people up. That's why he's called the devil. The word diabolos in Greek, which gives us the word devil in English, is from two Greek words, diabole, which means to tear apart. That's what the devil does. The Holy Spirit unites, and that's just the way it is. When your spirit is animating your body, all your cells stay together and cooperate. When your spirit leaves your body, the cells fall apart. You disintegrate. You decompose, what they say. Uh, you know, they say that when Mozart died uh, he, at 35, back in, what, 1791, something like that, he was so poor that he didn't have, couldn't afford his own coffin, and he was buried in a, in a common grave, a mass grave. They just dumped his body on top of a bunch of others and then covered him up, and they didn't know exactly where he was buried. But just a few years ago, they actually found his, um, uh, his tomb, and they dug him up, and they knew it was him, because they actually opened his coffin, the coffin that was there, and they found Mozart there actually sitting there erasing the score of his 40th symphony. And they said, Herr Mozart, was too easy. What are you doing? And he said, I'm just sitting here decomposing. That's, uh, that's, well, that's, uh, that, that didn't really happen. That's just bad, bad humor. I apologize for that. But, you know, the, 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 the spirit integrates, brings things together. The devil disintegrates, 
tears things apart. Uh, so the first mark of the church is unity. Uh, the second mark is holiness. Not that every single member of the church is profoundly holy, but the church herself is because she's the body and bride of Christ. And she certainly has the power to make us holy. And in fact, the church has quite a track record for producing not just canonizable, canonizable but actually canonized saints. And this has been going on for many centuries now. And, uh, you know, if you want holiness, you come to the Catholic Church because that's where you're going to find it. The section we're on right now is the Catholic part. Uh, Catholic is, again, from two Greek words, kata and holos, meaning according to, uh, in reference to, by way of the whole, the entire. Because, again, if you think, you know, if the, if the Jesus really did teach us the gospel truth and the gospel really are true, then the whole world will respond favorably to it. Because we may be different in an awful lot of ways. We may look different. We may be different heights and shapes and weights and have different hairstyles and colors of hair and colors of skin and colors of whatever, you know, freckles and non-freckles and you name it. Um, no matter all these differences that exist among people all over the world, we're all capable of the truth. And it's that truth that binds us together uh, and makes us one. And it's kind of something for the whole world. And it's really fascinating that every place in the world where the gospel has been preached, people have responded. People have understood that it's true, and they have responded not just with belief and being baptized, but by martyrdom. Uh, it's absolutely uplifting and inspiring the stories of the, of the more recent martyrs of the church, the martyrs of China, the martyrs which are going on today, uh, the martyrs of Vietnam, of Korea, of Africa, of Uganda, uh, the martyrs of uh, Japan. Oh, my goodness, you know. Uh, these are people who came very late to the story, you know. Uh, we tend to think of the church as largely a European thing, and for many centuries it seemed to be. But the missionaries have been very active. They've been going out all over the world. And every time the gospel is proclaimed, people believe. Believe to such an extent they're willing to sacrifice their lives. And um, that's what we're getting into today. Let's turn to pay, pardon me, paragraph number 852. Now, some of you have different versions of the editions of the catechism. Mine is the uh, uh, hardbound one. And uh, so we're not going by pages because the pages will all be different, but the paragraph numbers will be the same. So this is paragraph number, because every paragraph is numbered, this is paragraph number 852. Is this not where we left off last time? Okay, I'm getting on confirmation there from our holy deacon and his saintly wife. So they're, they're giving me confirmation here. Missionary paths. The Holy Spirit is the protagonist, the one who is the hero working on the behalf of the church, the principal agent of the whole of the church's mission, which is why when the gospel is preached, everybody can believe it, because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. If the Holy Spirit were not with the church, um, people would write us off as a bunch of quacks. I really, you know, St. Paul, I think, is a classic example of the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, St. Paul... I think I made this point before, but it's, it, it bears repeating. He's a pretty boring guy, you know. Uh, he's hard to understand. He's hard to read. I think a lot of people, especially those of you who have actually tried to read the letters of St. Paul to a congregation in church as a lector, you know. He's, he's not the easiest thing to understand. And if you feel that way, don't feel too bad, because even St. Peter had the same problem. In one of his letters in the New Testament, St. Peter said this, and this is an exact quote. He said, our brother Paul writes many things that are hard to understand. <laughs> and he's right. Uh, one thing St. Paul needed was an editor, somebody who would, would blue pencil his work and say, hey, Paul, your sentences are a paragraph long. They don't need to be that long. Sharpen them up, you know. Quit rambling on. And he'll change the subject of, of, his, of his statement in, in mid-sentence, in mid two or three times, actually. My favorite guy in all of the Bible is a guy named Eutychus. He's mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles. He's the guy, if you remember, uh, they were having mass in an upper room in a, in a house. And Eutychus was sitting in the window. And the windows did not have glass. They were just openings in the wall and with shutters. You know, that's how you close the window. 
and apparently the shutters were open, and Eutychus was sitting there in this open window. And the scripture says that Paul spoke at such great length that Eutychus fell asleep and fell out the window. <laughs> apparently, it's only a second story, so it wasn't hurt too bad. He actually survived, but that, that's the effect that St. Paul could have on people. But also, um, the other effect was he engendered tremendous faith. You know, he walked into uh, Corinth, which was the Las Vegas of the ancient world. Um, these people were, I mean, really, uh, they could teach Las Vegas how to be Las Vegas. Um, in the Acro Corinth, the, the high point of the city, there was a temple of Venus, who was the goddess of love, you know. And I don't mean love, I mean love, you know. And every night, 1,000 temple prostitutes would come down the mountain into town where there were a bunch of sailors. This was an isthmus, and sailors would cross. There were always a bunch of sailors there. You know how sailors are. They got a reputation, apparently, as well-deserved. And these women made a very comfortable living, as they say. St. Paul goes into this town and starts preaching, as St. Paul did, and they all became Catholics. Now, they kept backsliding, okay, and he kept writing them letters, okay. But the bottom line is that he, he talked them all into becoming Catholics, they would give up their, their evil and salacious ways. My goodness, you know. He could have that effect. And it wasn't him, it was the Holy Spirit. Because apparently when St. Paul preached, he would just to relied totally on the Holy Spirit to make his words effective. And they became terribly effective. But the one time, the one time that St. Paul is cogent and on point and makes perfect logical sense is when he went to Athens. He figured this is the big college town. This is Cambridge, Massachusetts. That Harvard is here. MIT is here. I can't just get up and preach as I usually do. These well-educated Athenians will zone me out. And it's there. His entire speech to the Athenians, I think it's in the 18th chapter of Acts, and he talks about how you have all these gods, and you even have a, a, a plinth here for an unknown god. Well, let me tell you about that god. Very clever introduction, you know. If you if you ever took a course on writing a speech, they tell you this is exactly the kind of lead-in you want. And then he says they start telling him this is the God who made everything. This is the God, the maker of all, and his son Jesus Christ, and etc. etc. Cetera, et cetera. And he makes perfect sense. He's easy to understand. He's even persuasive. But the Athenians said, uh, "Resurrection, uh, we will hear you some other." Time, brother, don't call us, we'll call you. Two converts, two converts out of all of Athens, because he was relying more on himself than on the Holy Spirit. When Paul relied on the Holy Spirit to do the talking, he changed hearts and minds, and he changed the, the course of nations. Uh, because the Holy Spirit, as it says here, is the protagonist, the principal agent of the whole church's mission. It is he who leads the church on her missionary paths. This mission continues and, in the course of history, unfolds the mission of Christ, who was sent to evangelize to the poor, so that the church, urged on by the Spirit of Christ, must walk the road Christ himself walked, a way of poverty and obedience, of service and self-sacrifice, even to death, a death from which he emerged victorious by his resurrection. So it is that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the Christians, as Tertullian said, many centuries ago. The whole idea here, folks, is that, um, you know, the, when the church started to really grow in numbers, uh, many people looked upon it as a threat uh, because the pagans had their own specific take on things. Um, in paganism, if you weren't worshiping the false gods, you were part of the problem. That every time there was an earthquake of or a volcano erupting is because these Christians weren't worshiping the pagan gods. And so we got persecuted because we got to stamp this out, you know. We got to stop this bad religion. That's what they, how they looked at us. And they tortured us to death. And you would think that facing torturous death, that would convince an awful lot of people not to get baptized. Well... And for, for many, it did. I mean, a lot of people didn't get baptized for that reason. But the way in which the Catholics, the first generations of the church, face martyrdom with absolute courage, absolute, absolute equipoise and equanimity, these people, with, you know, they, they were actually singing 
on their way to being martyred. What was waiting for them was they're going to be torn apart by wild animals, burned at the stake, uh, crucified even, you know, in various embarrassing positions. Um, and yet they did this with an absolute courage. And the people who saw this said, you know, I think these people might be crazy, but they obviously have something that I don't. I couldn't face death like that. I couldn't have that kind of courage. What made them so confident that they were willing to pay this price, that they were willing to undergo torturous death? Remember, Jesus called the, the kingdom the pearl of great price. It's the kind of thing that when you see it, it is, you recognize right away it is so valuable, no matter what it costs you, you're willing to pay it, and it's worth it. And that was that kind, was that kind of witness that convinced the people of the Roman Empire that maybe these Catholics got something. Maybe you know, their, their blood is something that does not dissuade us, rather it persuades us. Um, there's something here that I have to get for myself. And it wasn't just the martyrs of Rome, the martyrs of Uganda, the martyrs of Japan, the martyrs of Korea, the martyrs of Vietnam, on and on and on. And it's a path that even still today, the more you persecute the church, the stronger we get. 853. On her pilgrimage, the church has also experienced the discrepancy existing between the message she proclaims and the human weakness of those to whom the gospel has been entrusted. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we, God relies on human beings who are very fallible, who are very weak in many ways, um, susceptible to temptation, susceptible to misdirection. Uh, we are, as Jesus told the apostles, the devil will sift you like wheat, and many times he has. Pardon me, many times he has. Only by taking the way of penance and renewal, the narrow way of the cross, can the people of God extend Christ's reign. Yeah. In other words, we are sinners, and we've got to recognize that fact. But that's the message that we bring. We're all sinners. Uh, the big difference between us and the pagans is that we're offering you a way out of your sins. Uh, there's a way you can become whole again. And for an awful lot of people, um, that message is just too good to be true. I've talked to certain um, uh, people from Africa who are like second and third generation in the Catholic Church. And their uh, grandparents, in some cases, or maybe great-grandparents, are still alive, but they wouldn't become Catholic um, because they thought Catholicism was too easy. Many, much of their religion is based on nature. And let's face it, nature never forgives. There is no reverse gear in nature. You cannot unbreak your leg. If you do something stupid and break your leg, you've got a broken leg. And it may take you know, six weeks or eight weeks or two months to get healed, but that's what it takes. You just can't say, gee, I'm sorry, I did something wrong, and your leg gets better again. No, nature doesn't work that way. But God doesn't work that way, that if you just tell God you're sorry, he will forgive you, no matter what you've done. And for an awful lot of those people, it's like, what? Nah, that can't be right. You know, what kind of God would do that? You know, that just doesn't make any sense. Well, whether it makes sense or not is the truth. And that's the message that we bring, is that there's a way out of your sins. And um, that's what the, the message of the cross really is all about. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. The statement is, it's not a question, it's a statement. <laughs> and the statement is that a lot of people criticize the Catholic Church for confession, that the, what they see it as, you can go out and party like a fool, go to confession, be forgiven, and go out and party like a fool again, and, and then just keep doing that your whole life through. Well, yeah, that's the, we call that cheap grace. Um, and it really is it's obviously an abuse of the sacrament, an abuse of, of theology. Uh, because, you know, along with confession is that firm purpose of amendment, you know, I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to sin no more and to avoid even the near occasions of sin. Uh, if that's not there, then the, the confession is not valid, you know, the forgiveness is not given. You know, you, there has to be, now you may fail again, you know, and you may know you're going to fail again, 
but at least you've got that. It's, I, I really don't want to do this anymore. I know I, I'm really going to make it work this time. I'm going to try my best and uh, put forth my best effort. That has to be there. If that's not there, then you know the whole thing is just not invalid. Yeah, anybody who takes the attitude, because we we call that the sin of presumption, right? Um, and it is a sin. It's a sin that no matter what I do, God's going to forgive me, and I just keep just keep on doing it. And I'll, I'm going to time this just perfect so that the day when I breathe my last breath, my last breath is to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for my sins and you know and all this stuff, and I'll go straight to heaven. Well, uh, you know, okay, you know, you can try that if you want, but um, that's really not what the church teaches. We teach just the opposite that. Um, to be forgiven, you have to have this really sorry for your sins uh, and for the right reason, not just the fear of hell, but you know that you've offended God, whom you should love above all things. Um, but yeah, that's uh, remember, remember in Hamlet, um, the great scene where um, Polonius was saying his prayers and Hamlet was going to kill him, murder him, really. And uh, then he started having second thoughts. He said, no, he's saying his prayers. If I murder him now, he'll go straight to heaven. If I catch him, you know, committing adultery and kill a man, then he'll go straight to hell. It's like, oh, well, now that is really cold thinking. I mean, I, I don't know if it really works that way either. But, but um, anyway, but you get the point. Is that, you know, that's obviously, you know, the Catholic Church doesn't teach that. Uh, if there's no firm purpose of the amendment, there is no... Um, you know, forgiveness of sins. But that's what we're here for, you know. We are all sinners, and that's the whole purpose why Christ came to earth, to take away our sins and make it possible for each one of us to live a uh, just and, and right life. That we don't have to be chained to our sins for all our earthly existence, and certainly not for, you know, the heavenly existence. Um, you know, it's like, uh, like, remember Marley's ghost from Scrooge? Uh, we had that big, long chain of all the sins he committed, and he's got to drag that for all eternity. What a horrible thing. What a horrible thing. Uh, that's pretty much what hell would be like. Uh, Christ came to unlock us from that chain, you know, that we don't have to carry this, this burden forever. And, you know, thank God for that. Um, it was like St. Paul wrote to the Galatians, and he talked about, you know, how fornicators and adulterers and boy lovers and if he goes to the whole list, murderers, you name it, you know, every you know, despicable thing you can do. These people will not get into heaven. He said, and so were some of you. Some of you were in this, this situation. And it was true. But not anymore. Uh, we are that new man in Christ because of the power of God's grace. And that's the message that the uh, missionaries take with them. I love the way that Bishop Sheen described the missionary activity of the church. He described our missionaries as, well, like officers of the probate court. You know, if, if you get a subpoena from the regular court, you're probably in trouble. You're called in to testify or, you know, be prosecuted or something. Um, but the probate court, when they come to your door, it's usually a twofold message. Somebody died, bad news, good news, you profited from it. They remembered you in their will. Oh, thank you very much. And in this case, the person who died was Jesus Christ, and what we inherit is everlasting life, the forgiveness of our sins, the life of grace, and holiness. Um, pretty good stuff. And that's pretty much what the missionary activity of the church is all about. Somebody died and left you a fortune. The person who died was no less a person than Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself. What he left you was eternal life. Very nice. For just as Christ carried out the work of redemption in poverty and oppression, so the church is called to follow the same path if she is to communicate the fruits of salvation to men. And this is pretty much, you know, the, the way our missionaries operate. They, they live among the people, you know. They live as the people live. Um, they learn their languages and speak them. Um, and they become one with them. And they lift them up to the truths of Christ and the gospel, and it's really nice to see. We have, uh, you know, if you're ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of St. Louis, you're not really, you're a parish priest, and, you know, to serve in St. Louis. But we do have some men that we send out as missionaries uh, to Latin America. 
with Livia specifically. And, and um, frankly, they're some of our best men, and we're, it's a shame we lose them. But they do tremendous work down there, and uh, it's interesting to watch the change in them. Uh, I knew a couple of the guys that went down, and um, they just really can't come back after a while. Um, they love the people so much. Uh, they've embraced the lifestyle, and they just really, um, they just can't be, you know, your typical South Side American anymore. Um, because they really do become so much with the people. It's very, very enlightening and heartening to see. By 854, by her very mission, the church travels the same journey as all humanity and shares the same earthly lot with the world. She is to be 11, 11 and, as it were, the soul of human society and is renewed by Christ and the transformation into the family of God. This uh, metaphor of leavening Asian, you know, yeast put into dough, uh, has been around in the church for a really long time. The church has always considered herself to be a leavening agent. Uh, the, the big wad of dough is there, uh, but we go to work on it. A little bit of leaven, that's all it takes. It's a little bit. Because in the, most of our history, the church was a tremendous minority, and we still are in an awful lot of places. Um, but we accept that. We know that a lot of people just, you know, just for whatever, for whatever reason, they're not ready or whatever. Uh, they don't embrace the gospel. That's okay. We live among them, and we make their society better. We just make things fluffy. That's what, that's what yeast does to the dough. It makes it more palatable. Uh, it enriches it. Um, that's pretty much, you know, how, what the church is all about. Um and, you know, and we have. I mean, look here in the Archdiocese of St. Louis, uh, the Catholic population is about, officially, we're about 22% of the total population in the metro area. Uh, but that's among the people who claim to be Catholic. And, you know, a lot of these you just never see. So, you know, how many active? Uh, less than that. And yet, if you look at it, you know, we're the ones that build the hospitals. There were very few non-Catholic hospitals in our area. Uh, apart from the public schools, you know, we build the schools. Um, apart from Uncle Sam, who doles out most of the, you know, money to people who are poor and in need. After that, who is it? Was well, the Vincent Paul Society? Uh, the other churches just don't have anything even close to that. Um, again, we're a small minority, but you know, we are that piece, a little piece of leaven, making the whole society richer. We have special schools for the blind and for the mentally handicapped. Um, we have special hospitals for children, people with different problems. We used to have a hospital for people with tuberculosis, you know, Mount St. Rose down in Lime. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. Um, I think of Mother Teresa's sisters in India. You know, the, the Catholic population in India is maybe, maybe 1%. You know, it's very, very small. And yet, you know, Mother Teresa, after she died, she was declared officially the mother of India. Now, that's really saying something. First of all, she wasn't really from India. She was from Albania. And uh, the other person to get that title was Gandhi. He was the father of India. And to give her the... But, but she has so transformed this society in India by the work that she and her sisters did. You know, it was just, you know... Again, it was just that powerful of a witness. And the church has always kind of taken upon herself that way. Okay, so we're not the majority. We can still work like leaven to make the society a better place. And we do. Do we always get thanked for it? No. <laughs> no. no. Hardly at all, really. But that doesn't stop us. We still do it. You know? And I still get back to the fact that, you know, it's amazing how you look at the occupations that don't pay much, that involve great personal risk or sacrifice, or involve great, you know, doing things that are frankly kind of disgusting. Um, the Catholics are there. I mean, in, in numbers way beyond our proportion. Um, you know, when, when they had the 9-11 thing, they had the funerals for all the coppers and, and firemen who died in the buildings. 92% were Catholic. 92%. And you'll find that's true of soldiers in the military, of policemen, of firemen, of teachers, of nurses. Um, 
anybody who has to do disgusting stuff without much pay, we Catholics are there. I mean, we are really, really there. And even if these are people that don't really practice the Catholic faith every Sunday, they were raised Catholic, they went to Catholic school, they accept, you know, the Catholic understanding and, and you know, mission of things. And it makes a big difference. It makes a huge difference. If those people weren't there, I mean, our society would be in a heck of a shape. I mean a heck of a shape. But, you know, because we Catholics are here, and this is what, just what we do, it makes a big difference. Like the leaven in the, in the, the loaf of the bread. Uh, missionary endeavor requires patience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, the patience of a fisherman, you know, if you ever see it, if you ever try to do the catch of fish uh, on, the, on the bank, you just sit there and you wait for the thing. <laughs> you can wait a heck of a long time. But that's what it is. And when, but when you finally get that bite, that first bite, you jump up on it and uh, you get something going. And it's, 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 yeah. It begins with the proclamation of the gospel to peoples and groups who do not yet believe in Christ continues with the establishment of Christian communities that are a sign of God's presence in the world, and leads to the foundation of local churches. In other words, you're getting people who, not just to accept what you're saying, but to, to interiorize it in such a way they actually change their lives. They start to buy into it. You know, they start to say, hey, you know, maybe the way I'm living isn't the best way. Maybe I need to be more service-oriented and think less of myself and more of God, more of my family, more of the people I live with, um, and to love, even my enemies and persecutors. When that kind of stuff starts happening, now you've got a Christian community. It must involve a process of inculturation if the gospel is to take flesh in each people's culture. Yeah. Did you ever see the movie The Mission? It came out ooh, back in the, I'm going to say late 80s. Robert De Niro was in it, uh, Jeremy Irons. Uh, it, was, it was about the, the, the Jesuit missions in South America. And it was a, ter- it was a tragic story. It, it was written by Robert Bolt, the man who wrote The Man for All Seasons. Um, and it was... Uh, uh, the, the Jesuits had a program, and they called it the reduction, the reductiones, the reductions. And that was to take, just like, you know... Um, uh, when, the, you know, for example, the, the church came to Greece. Now, the church had just come from Israel, where the people spoke Hebrew. We didn't force the Hebrew language on the Greeks. In fact, we let them speak Greek. In fact, Greek became the language of the church because it was the common language of most people. Uh, we didn't try to impose a Jewish culture on people who became Catholic. Instead, we just said, okay, you can take your culture, whatever it is, but now it's going to become Christian. And the Jesuits took the same attitude toward the, uh, the pe- indigenous peoples of South America. And they were able to accomplish, according to this movie, they, they accomplished marvels. I think they actually didn't accomplish as much as, um, you know, it was uh, the, the movie shows. Uh, in the end, the reductions wound up being not a, not a failure, but, you know, not the resounding success that they hoped it would be. But it did make a big difference. And that has always been the, the idea of the church, not to impose a culture on people, but rather to take their culture and what's good about it and to transform it into something even better. Now, in a lot of cases, they go someplace where people were practicing polygamy. That happened a lot, you know. Or they'd have this thing where you had to buy your, your wife. Uh, <laughs> you had to pay the, her father real money to, to get married. And there's other immoral practices that went along with that. And, um, you know, different things like that. And we had to say, no, no, no. And, and you know, when the, when the, the we first came to South America, oh, my goodness, we found these huge charnel houses full of the skeletons of little children who had been sacrificed by their parents to the false gods. And uh, I said, man, that's got to stop, you know. But those kind of things went on. Uh, um, but like I say, they did. You know, to be a truly Catholic culture, uh, we respect the culture as much as we can. Understanding to make it a Christian means we're going to have to change some things. There will be times of defeat, yes, with regard to individuals, groups, and peoples. It is only by degrees that the church touches and penetrates them, and so receives them into a fullness which is Catholic. 
But eventually, you know, it's amazing how I, I, Pope John the Twenty Third, Saint John the Twenty Third, had a saying that um, "Guta lapidem capant," that little drops of water will eventually wear away a stone, and they do. We keep, keep coming back. We keep coming at them. We keep coming at them with the gospel, and eventually, 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 we win. We win out because. Pardon me, the truth in the end is, is irresistible. It's, you know, we are the suckers for the truth. And once people embrace this truth, um, the whole world is changed. 855. The church's mission stimulates efforts toward Christian unity. Yes, we've talked about the unity thing. And um, again, to bring the whole world together into one. That as different as people are, and they have different attitudes toward pretty much everything, when it comes to matters of faith, we can all believe the same thing. We can all worship the same way. It is, I always find it thrilling to go to Mass at St. Peter's Basilica, not for a big feast day with the Pope or something, but just in the early morning before the church is really open to the tourists. And uh, you see all the different peoples of the world coming for the, for the individual Masses. And... Um, if they don't have their own priest, they'll come in with ear group, you know. And they, they, may, they may not have, understand a word of English. It doesn't make any difference. They come. I know the old Italian ladies, they always show, they're all widows. They show up in their black outfits, you know, and they wait by the door. And they say, uh, Che lingua, padre? What language is he? English. Oh, English. Oh, English. No, no, no. We want Italian, you know. Uh, sorry, you know. And they usually find it an Italian mass. But it's amazing. the Japanese and the Africans and the Chinese and, the, and even people from South St. Louis, you know, they all come together at St. Peter's. And it's just it's a beautiful thing to see. And we can all worship together, all receive the Eucharist together in the one, one place with Saint, the bones of St. Peter. Um, indeed, divisions among Christians prevent the church from realizing and practice the fullness of Catholicity properly to her in those of her sons who, though joined to her by baptism, are yet separated from full communion with her. Furthermore, the church herself finds it more difficult to express in actual life her full Catholicity in all its aspects. Yeah, sadly, because of the differences among people. People can't get along. People don't agree. Um, you've got the whole Protestant thing going on. And uh, even among Catholics, we've got the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics, us. And there are disagreements, and there are you know, things that, that do kind of stand in the way of unity. We're working hard to overcome those things. Again, relying on the Holy Spirit to make it happen, because that's the only way it possibly can happen. And uh, the more we rely on the Holy Spirit, the more these things are taken care of. Um, and um, all I can say on that. Any, I, I meant to start with well, any questions on anything. I, I, um, you know, it's been a few months since we had class, and if you've been if something, if some thought occurred to you back in July, but you didn't have a chance to to raise it. Anybody? Okay. If you do have any questions, just about any. Oh yes, yeah, Teresa. Our particular Archbishop. They got this big dartboard, and they got a, you know. <laughs> well, you know how they picked the first bishops? It was by throwing dice, you know. <laughs> and sometimes you wonder. Uh, no, there, there is a process for that. Um, what go is, is, is a, there's an ongoing um, process in which the church contacts individual priests and asks them, who do you think would be a good bishop? And um, when they get these names, uh, they send out letters to other priests who know this guy, like the guy's classmates or, you know, people who uh, serve with them, that kind of thing. It's a very lengthy questionnaire. I've gotten a couple of these over the years uh, about Father so-and-so. Tell us about him. You know, what do you think are his strong points? What do you think, what weaknesses do we have? Would he make a good bishop? Why or why not? You know, that kind of thing. And once they go through the screening process and they think they've got a good candidate, his name goes into a file. <laughs> You've got files of all kinds of stuff. 
And then um, when the bishop dies or retires, as in the case of Archbishop Carlson, um, the uh, apostolic delegate in Rome will present the Pope with a list of three names. It's called a terna, a list of three. And we think these three guys would be the best because the Pope doesn't know these people. You know, sometimes he does, but usually not. And so, um, so he, you know, asks questions and you know, da, da, da. And if he doesn't like any of them, he says, no, 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 give me another list. You know? And so he gets him another list of three. But usually it's the, the first one. There's somebody on that list who, and it's the Holy Father himself who makes that determination. And uh, that's how it's done. That's how the bishop is chosen. Um, in the case of an archdiocese like St. Louis, uh, typically they would not take a man who isn't a bishop already and make him a bishop for the archdiocese. They'll take a guy who's going to, you know, someplace else. Like Carlson had been in Sioux, Sioux Falls, uh, South Dakota, and um, what was that place in uh, Michigan where he was? Um, oh, Saginaw, thank you. Saginaw, Michigan. And, uh, you know, Archbishop Cardinal Burke was uh, Bishop of the Cross before he came here. Uh, Archbishop, or Cardinal Ritter was Archbishop of Indianapolis before he came here. Cardinal Carberry was the, Arch, or was the Bishop of Lafayette, Indiana before he came here. Uh, Archbishop May was from Mobile, Alabama when he came here. And um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's kind of how it goes. But, uh, you know, for a small diocese, uh, tip like, like Springfield Cape Dorado, for example, where Bishop Rice is the bishop, uh, he was the auxiliary bishop in St. Louis for a while, and then they made him the bishop of Springfield Cape Dorado. And theoretically, he could become Archbishop of Chicago or Boston or someplace, you know, theoretically, could possibly happen. Or he could become Pope, you know, come on, yeah. Uh, but that's kind of how it goes. Is that, you know, okay. But uh, there is a, there's a very elaborate screening process, and um, there's a lot of questions. You know, I, I, like I say, I answer these questionnaires, and they're, they're pretty thick, you know. And um, it's, you know, and they want you to be honest, and so I, I, I told them the whole the truth as I knew it. So, sounds like this. Thank you. Yes. Second Vatican Council. Yeah. What? Yeah. What possesses the base of any change in the Vatican Council? Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah.
Betty used to talk about that, you know, there was a there was a real hard, firm Catholic culture. You knew what side of the line it was on. You know, if this is right, this is wrong. And I don't care who you are, what race you are, whatever, this is wrong, this is right, you know. And that's and there were certain things we Catholics do. We only eat on Friday, the nuns were to have it. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's hard to live that way, but you know, if you accept that and actually live it, pull it off. It's a pretty rich culture, you know. Everybody winds up being on the same page, and there's a certain bond of unity. I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, what happened at the Vatican Council, okay, and all this stuff changed after the Vatican Council. Uh, there's an awful lot of people who just wish we, in fact, there was a council back in, oh gosh, like the 14th century, that people just, it was such a disaster, people just ignored it, you know. And it, we're, we're moving on, folks. We're moving on. Um, boy, it, it, I, I could, you know, how much time do we have? Um, you know, it, it was a big mistake, a lot of it. You know, like, like say, for example, you know, communion in the hand and communion under both kinds. You know, these things that have been for, for centuries. We told people the host is so holy. You cannot touch it with your hands. The priest, because his hands were anointed, you can't do this. And I always said, well, sure you can. Wait a minute. You think that's not going to have an impact on people? You know? Um, only the priest can drink from the chalice. It's not a regular. And you have lay people just passing it around. It's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute here. They, they thought naively that all these things would engender a greater respect and appreciation for the Eucharist. That didn't happen. The opposite happened. I'm not saying it's because of this, but it sure wasn't the effect that people were looking for, you know, or at least what they justified. Uh, I think the one thing that the big, big difference that Catholics feel in the gut between the old and the new is that there was a sense of holiness. You walked into a Catholic church, you knew whose house it was. It wasn't some just room where, you know, what is this building? Is it a convention hall? Is it a Walmart? I mean, what is this place? You knew it was the house of God, and you, you knew that you, you kept silence, and you genuflect, and, and you know, all these customs and all these things. They were good. They were very good. And an awful lot of people, young people, are going back to that because they, they realize that, you know, uh, so much of the changes of the council, which really weren't mandated by the council, by the way, were a big loser. Uh, the communion of both kinds, that was Archbishop May. That, that was his idea. You know, uh, church never mandated that. Um, that was Archbishop makes thing. And he could do it because he's a bishop, but, you know, it really wasn't what was something the church demanded us to do. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, um, from time to time, the church does do some pretty stupid things. And, and I think the big problem with the Vatican Council, if you actually, if you read the actual documents of the Vatican Council, they're pretty good. You know, they really are pretty good, and they don't go as far as a lot of people carry them. What you found happening, and this was always the rationale you got, is, Father, why are you doing this? Well, I'm doing this in the spirit of Vatican II. Well, where do you show, show me in the, in, the, in, the, in the documents of Vatican II where it says that? Oh, well, it's in the spirit of Vatican II. Oh, the spirit? This is a poltergeist you're talking about here. This is not the Holy Spirit. Um, and a lot of just this hair, hair wire things just got carried away. And uh, plus society had changed too. People became very lax with a lot of things. And uh, the culture became very atheistic, you know, very, you know, hostile to religion. And, um, but it was religion that held society together, held families together, you know, at the building block of society. And um, the fact that, you know, the church had definite rules and you follow these rules or else, you know. That's what makes society society. Um, yeah, okay, dressing up for mass, yeah. Oh, I know, yeah. Yeah. You wear your best for God. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Right. Exactly. Every country did things a bit differently, uh, depending on who was ch in charge. You know, uh, some bishops were very liberal, very loose, and other ones were kind of strict. And um, uh, the ones that were strict tended to hold it, hold it together very, very well. I'm just talking about, you know, but you make a great point. I mean, one one value in society that has gone completely out the window is the idea of getting dressed up. You know, people. I mean, I, when I was when I was in union, um, we had these medallions that the different liturgical ministers would wear. The servers wore one color, uh, the, the Eucharistic ministers wore another color, and I had these beautiful blue ones because the parish was Our Lady Immaculate Conception uh, for the ushers. Well, the Eucharistic ministers wore theirs, the servers wore theirs, the ushers never wore theirs. And I figured of all the people who should be wearing one, the ushers, because that way you know who the ushers are, you know. And so I asked the one guy why he did it. He said, Father, that's too much like wearing a tie. <laughs> he probably got to wear a tie to save his life. I, uh, you know, the way people dress for weddings and funerals. Now, here in, in St. Louis, you know, people still pretty much dress up for these things. Although you will find that occasionally somebody comes in wearing jeans and a t-shirt, you know. But I tell you, I'm frank and happy. It is a normal thing. Uh, if you wear a suit to a funeral, you're, you're about the only guy in church that does that. Uh, very, very few people do. Uh, even for weddings, you know. They just wear whatever they feel like wearing. Um, it's, it's, it's a value that has pretty much gone out the window. I, uh, there, there's a... a an old church in downtown Washington, D.C. It's, it's right now it's in Chinatown. When it was founded, it was a German church. And uh, like I say, it's in Chinatown now. And they have the Latin Mass. Uh, Clarence Thomas goes there. Antony Scalia went there when he was still alive. And a lot of prominent people in Washington. Kathy Cannon goes there every Sunday. And whenever I'm there in D.C. on a Sunday, I always stop in for the Latin Mass. And... Uh, it's very, very interesting. I remember one Sunday, and it's like a time machine. Everybody there has a suit on and a tie, even the little kids, you know, they're all dressed up in the best, you know, and all this. It's, it's really, uh, it invigorates the spirit to see this, the people doing this. And I remember one Sunday, this young family comes waltzing in. They're five minutes late for Mass. And again, the other people, they're there 15 minutes early. They come here five minutes late for Mass, and Dad is walking in, and he's all got a kid on one arm and Helen on the other one. And he's wearing a Ben Roethlisberger jersey with a pair of shorts and flip-flops. <laughs> and the, other, the rest of the family is dressed the same way. And he comes storming in, and also he looks up and sees everybody is dressed up. He goes, oh! <laughs> like this. And, he, and he turns around and walks out. <laughs> and he's like, we don't fit in here, you know? Well, you know... Uh, and I always tell people, you know, if you want to change that and get people to dress up yourself, you know, there's nothing like, you know, walking into a room where you're the only person not wearing a tux to realize you're, you know, you don't belong. And um, I'm all in favor of that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I don't know. It, it's, but um, like I say, you know, you're right, Betty. It, it, there's a lot that uh, we've lost, and, and I don't think we're the better for it. You know, some some things we are. I think I think for good or ill, people are much more engaged in mass than what they used to be. Uh, and I could I could see this happening even at the Latin mass there in Washington D.C. That people are just and most people have their missiles and they're following along. But an awful lot of people they're walking to the stations of the cross, they're going to the confession, <laughs> they're dancing in their rosary, and it's like you know you should be praying the mass, you know. That was the big thing. Uh, if you remember the old days, people, you know, they weren't praying the mass. They were praying, they were praying, but they weren't praying the mass. And it was Saint Pius X back in the early 20th century who said, "When you come to the mass, pray the mass. Don't pray your devotions. Don't pray the, your rosary. Pray the mass. Uh, it's much more profitable." And I think we've seen a lot more of that. Um, but. Uh, but as you say, I mean, the, the one thing that has really gone, and, and, and it didn't have to be this way, it's just that sense of reverence, you know, that this is for God. 
and this is holy, you know, a, a sense of the sacred, a sense of the holy, a sense of, of yes, Kathy. Yeah, well, well, that's the whole thing. I mean, there's no reason why the, the no, why can't we say, why can't we just rekindle that? Yeah, yeah, no reason. Uh, the point is that the, the, the Novus Ordo Mass, the Mass we have now in English facing the people and all that, doesn't have to be irreverent, you know. Um, I'll tell you something, you know, having served the, the, the old Latin Mass when I was a kid, you know, uh, most of the priests weren't speaking Latin, they were speaking gibberish. Uh, I mean, they were going through it so fast, you know, and it's like, what is that man saying? You know, if Julius Caesar walked in, he wouldn't have understood the word of it, you know. And uh, if Jesus walked in, he'd have said, what is, what is this? What, what are we supposed to be mass? Um, there were a lot of abuse, abuses of the old mass, too. I think I've told this story. When I was first at Glennon, this is the early 70s, you know, and we had an old priest there who was the Latin and Greek teacher. And he never said the new mass. He always said the old Latin mass by himself up in the tower. You know, the seminary has this big tower. And that's where, before con celebration, each individual priest would go, and he had his own altar, and he'd say the mass. And so one day I'm walking down to the chapel for the student mass, and he taps me on the shoulder and says, come serve my mass. Okay, so, you know, so I go. And uh, we walk up to the tower there, and he's got his, it's his altar. It's, it's the only one, he's the only guy that uses it. And it was filthy. There were dead flies. There were cobwebs, there was dust, you know. But what really got me is in the corner of the altar was an ashtray with a bunch of ashes and cigarette butts in it. And I'm going, oh, no, no, don't tell me. <laughs> well, sure enough, right before mass started, he lit one up. And he puts it in the ashtray. And by the time he finished Mass, there were still four puffs left on his cigarette. He went through that thing in six minutes, you know. I mean, the whole Mass in six minutes now. Come on, you know, you know he's going 100 miles an hour. But he, he was a great guy. I really loved him. He was a wonderful priest. Uh, <laughs> he had a weird sense of humor, too. I remember right in the middle of Mass, he turns around and says to me, we're in the part of the Mass that's called the secret. You know what it is? And I, of course I did, but I, you know, I said, oh, Father, what, what is it? He said, I can't tell you, it's a secret. And he turns around. I'm going, is he trying to be funny or what? You, know? you wouldn't think that, but well, anyway. But like I say, that kind of stuff went on. Um, yeah, there were a lot of priests that say Mass in you know, 10 minutes or less. You know, it was abuse, terrible abuse. I, you know, I, every time I, I hear people tell me the priest that I went to school with, you know, they go through mass in you know 15 minutes. I go, really? You know, wow. You know, he's got really uh, anything to brag about. Yeah. 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 The people used to pray rosary at, at visitations and at wakes, you know, and I'm used to that, yeah. I, and, you know, when I was in union, we, that was a, we always said the rosary. It, it, the ladies drove, you know, the, it came for the women and the men's group came for the men, you know, and we led the rosary. And it's a common, and it, that's still being done mostly in country places, though. Yeah. I know it, it, it doesn't have to be that way. We've gotten away from that, you know, and, uh, Sadly, you know, the phenomenon that I face an awful lot of is you go to a wake of a, of a dear parishioner who is very faithful, daily mass, whatever, you know, every day, every Sunday he or she was there. But her kids have no religion at all, none whatsoever. And uh, you try to say prayers at the wake, and they're, they're chatting in the back and, you know, just carrying on. It doesn't mean anything to you, does it? Yeah. 
So people were talking during the funeral. Well, good for him. And the priest stopped the funeral mass and said, if you can't shut up, get out there. <laughs> I, I give that guy a purple heart, you know. <laughs> that's uh, that's how it should be, you know. But that's what we're faced with so often, you know, when people are in a situation where they feel they have to come to church, even though they don't believe anything. And, and, they, and frankly, a lot of them, they don't know what to do. They just don't know what to do. An awful lot of our young people, you pop them down in a Catholic church, like for Ad Eucharist Adoration, they don't know what to do. They don't have a clue. It's very sad. I think it's changing now. I think it, we're finally you know, starting to come back around. I, I got a lot of hope with many of our young people um, because they've seen the wreck and ruin of it, and they're, they're not buying in. You know, We want something better. We've been lied to. We've been cheated. Uh, things we should have been taught, things that should have been impressed on us, we were swindled about it. And they're mad about it, and they want you know, to get, get back into the game. But, uh, no, I mean, Betty, it's a very good point and a very good question. Um, and the thing is, you know, you, you know, it's easy to say those people need to do this and those people need to do that. We need to do it. You know, we need to dress up on Sundays. We need to pray fervently. We need to, you know, uh, be our very best behavior and really take our faith seriously. And uh, as the missionaries go to the foreign countries preaching, uh, we preach – most effectively by just the way we, we live and, and do things right. Um, as St. Francis of Assisi said, you should always preach, but only use words when necessary. Um, the example should be, you know, enough um, to persuade people. Okay, 856. The missionary task implies a respectful dialogue with those who do not yet accept the gospel. Um, in other words, we don't we don't convert by the sword. We don't walk in and say, "Okay, we're the conquistadors. Either you get baptized or we kill you." Um, that never works. You know, um, Islam tries to do that, and um, you know, it, it really doesn't work. Uh, you don't win people's hearts and minds if it's not if, some, if it's something forced on them, like a shotgun in marriage. You know, that's not really very romantic. Um, and it's the same thing with that. Uh, now, it's interesting how, you know, when the conquistadors first came to Mexico, um, they brought missionaries with them, and the missionaries, again, they, they didn't try to force religion on anybody. It was just like, here it is, folks, and this is the truth, and, you know, we're, this is what we believe, and this is why we believe it, and da 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 da, da. But the Indians just weren't buying it until Juan Diego and the miraculous image of the Blessed Mother, Our Lady of Guadalupe. It was the biggest mass conversion in the history of the world. Uh, millions of people within just a year or two got themselves baptized and really embraced the Catholic faith big time um, because of the holy apparition and the miracles of Guadalupe. It's, it's, it's great stuff. Great stuff. So God is always working with his church, confirming us in what we believe. Um, Believers can profit from this dialogue by learning to appreciate better those elements of truth and grace which are found among peoples and which are, as it were, a secret presence of God. Yeah, everybody has a spark of divinity. There's nobody who ever walked the earth who was completely bad, completely evil, completely, you know, wrong in everything. The fact that you can make it in this world and survive till you're 50 or 60 means you've got to be doing something right. And... Um, it's taking that and building upon it, not just coming in and saying everything you people are doing is wrong, you got to rebuild everything. No, no, no. You take what's good, you work with it, you build it up into something uh, even better, like the leaven in the, in the loaf of bread. Um, they proclaim the good news to those who do not know it in order to consolidate, complete, and raise up the truth and the goodness that God has distributed among men and nations and to purify them from error and evil for the glory of God, the confusion of the demon, and the happiness of men. Now, this is the one thing. Uh, sadly, you know, this is all beautiful stuff, and this is a pretty good exposition, I think, of what the church's mission is all about and, and how we can go about it. But that's the one thing that we have, the one big area of the church that really needs to be beefed up is our missionary activity. 
I mean, we don't have to go to foreign countries. Right here in our own country, you know, there's people who are completely unchurched, have no religion whatsoever, um, and may even be well disposed to receive the, the, the truth of the gospel. Uh, I really think, and I have, I have great hopes and maybe even expectations, that one day most of Islam will become Catholic. Um, I think it's could well could well happen, but we got to get off the stick. I mean, we got to uh, start taking this seriously. And um, the more the Muslims are part of American culture, and the more their eyes are open, you know, to the other ways and religions, um, I can just see a great conversion happening, and it would be a wonderful thing. Um, you know. Uh, Bishop Sheen foresaw this back in the early 1950s. You know, nobody ever thought about you know, these kinds of things. Uh, and he, but he said the Blessed Mother would be the way to do it because the Quran speaks effusively, uh, overflowingly, the praise and love to the Blessed Mother. It really does. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, let's talk about the Blessed Mother then. And maybe she can do for this what the, she did in Guadalupe for the people of Mexico. But it's something that I think, you know, I mean, even when I was a kid, um, there were people who wanted to be missionaries. You know, kids in the family, oh, I'm to be missionaries. You know, that's just almost completely gone out the window. Um, sadly, many of our great missionary orders, like Mary Knoll, um, who used to do tremendous work, even the Jesuits, you know, tremendous work around the world, have gotten a little bit goofy. Uh, Mary Knoll especially has gotten very goofy. Um, so much so that it's like there, you know, there, there was uh, liberation theology and uh, Marxism and all this other kind of stuff. Stuff that is really anti-Catholic or opposed to the mission of the Catholic Church. And when you get in, in that kind of stuff, you know, whoa, you know, uh, you think the church would prevent that kind of stuff from happening, but, you know, you do. Um, any questions? Any uh, Disputations and about eight thirty. Well, you've all been very attentive, <laughs> and like I say, we do this every first and third Tuesday. Um, we, we can keep live streaming it for some reason you can't come, but uh, glad to have you with us. And um, yeah, okay, you're at peace. So we'll pick up next time. Uh, that will be on the 15th, Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows, uh, the church being apostolic. Huh? Okay. This is the first. Okay. One holy Catholic and apostolic. Okay.